While I was in California a couple of years back, I had dinner with a young Navy lieutenant and his wife and family. Uh, these were very dear Christian people and he was about to retire from the military and he was contemplating going into ministry after his military career uh, was over. And so he asked me a lot of questions about, you know, what is it like working you know, as a minister? What's that, what's that all about? You know, get a little bit of uh, information from someone who had been doing that for a while. What training would he need? How was he to begin? Uh, what does this work? Uh, you know, what is it really like on a daily basis? You know, you, usually people just see the preacher up in the pulpit preaching on, on Sunday or teaching a class, but what is it like on a daily basis? Now you need to understand that this man in his role as a Navy officer, he was responsible for hundreds of people and the efficient completion of their tasks and he wanted to know if there were any comparisons between you know, his Navy career as a lieutenant and perhaps his career as a minister. And so in trying to sum up the core idea of being a minister, I told him that if he wanted to become a preacher, he needed to get used to dealing with failure, not efficiency. Because ministry is all about dealing with people's sins, not their successes. People rarely call me at 2 a.m. to tell me about their success. People rarely write me a note to tell me about their promotion. People rarely call the office or just walk straight, can I see you for a minute, you know, to tell me that they have just uh, you know, bought some stock that has you know, appreciated in value. I never get those calls. Before people become Christians, they need to see that they are sinners. That's why being a preacher is about dealing with sin. We have to tell people that they're sinners so that they can recognize their need for Christ. And then when people become Christians, well, they need to be reassured that Jesus takes away all of their sins that they are now so clearly aware of. So you make them aware of sin, and they come to the gospel and then they're clearly aware of sin and all of a sudden as Christians they start worrying about sin. And so then you're trying to comfort them to reassure them that it's okay, you know, Jesus is crossed, they, it takes care of that. And then as they mature in Christ, the task is to make sure that they don't lose sight of their, uh, of their need for God's mercy and become overly self-righteous in thinking, well, they don't have any sin. Or maybe reassure them that God's mercy and grace continues to save them despite the painful awareness of their sin. No matter how hard they try, and sin continues to be a major factor in their lives, even as Christians. So you see in ministry, sin is always part of the equation. In ministry, you can never get away from dealing with sin in one way or another. And I suppose this is why the writers of the New Testament spent so much time writing about sin and its consequences, especially Paul the Apostle in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter seven and eight, the Apostle zeroes in on one of the most perplexing questions concerning our experience with sin. And that is, are we slaves of it or are we free from it? Understanding the answer to this question usually dictates the quality of life that we have as Christians. Slave or free? Now in the book of Romans, Paul has a lot to say about sinfulness and its effects. In chapters one, two, and three, he makes the case that everyone who ever lived is guilty of sin, Jew and Gentile. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God and everyone is subject to God's judgment and condemnation. Spends three chapters explaining that idea. Then in chapters four, five, and six, he explains in detail the good news, that despite this guilt, God offers everyone forgiveness and eternal life based on faith in Jesus Christ, expressed in repentance and baptism. 
something that everyone is capable of understanding, everyone is capable of, of doing. It is in chapters seven and eight, however, that he deals with a seeming contradiction that appears to all those who have become Christians. If I am, and here it is, if I am free from sin and condemnation through faith in Jesus Christ, if I'm free like that, why is sin still causing so many problems in my life? I mean, the Bible says I'm free from sin, but in my everyday experience, I have to deal with sin that seems even more powerful than before I became a Christian. I never thought about sin before I became a Christian. Are you kidding me? I never gave it, I never gave it a, mo a moment's thought. But after I became a Christian, boy, I saw sin everywhere. So the questions become, am I a slave or am I free? Which is it? So this is the question that Paul teaches about in Romans chapter seven and eight. And this is what he says. Number one, as long as we Christians live in this mortal body, sin will always have an effect on us. He says in Romans seven eighteen, and I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. It's a sad and difficult fact that we as Christians remain subject to the power of sin. Paul says that even as Christians who know and desire to avoid sin, to overcome sin, to denounce it in ourselves and in the world, there is nevertheless failure to live up to the ideal that we know and want. I see the ideal, I see the best me, I see the best me all the time, but I can never get to the best me even though I see him. Paul says, the trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Romans chapter seven, verse 13. Doesn't that well describe a Christian's experience when he or she falls into sin? So Paul uses himself as an example of a mature, productive Christian who struggles and fails to overcome sin in his life. So the second thing he teaches is this, even if we are subject to the effect of sin, we as Christians are not slaves to sin. There's a difference. There's a big difference here between being affected by sin and being a slave to sin. Let me give you an example. At one time, the Israelites lived in Egypt under the same hot sun that the Egyptians lived under. They couldn't get away from it. They felt the heat of the sun and they had to deal with it. However, unlike the Egyptians, they didn't worship the sun. The sun didn't dictate the character of their lives, their hopes, their fears, and so on and so forth. And so the Israelites were affected by the hot Egyptian sun, but they were not slaves in mind and spirit to it as the Egyptians were. Well, in the same way, in chapter eight of Romans, Paul says that despite the influence of sin in our, our lives, you know that hot sun of sin, we can overcome its influence to the point that while sin is part of our human nature, it is not what guides and directs our lives. Paul explains in chapter eight how God has enabled us to do this. And let's read that, chapter eight, verse three and four. He says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's as if before Christ, we had this raging bull on a leash that was pulling us along and dragging us whenever, uh, wherever he wanted to go. Imagine that. Imagine if you had a wild bull on a leash, big rope, <laughs> be dragging you all over the place, wouldn't it? But Paul says that Christ's sacrifice has reduced this beast to a barking chihuahua. 
that's annoying, that makes a lot of noise, that bites our ankle once in a while, but we can control it by just yanking on that leash. Another thing Paul says in chapter eight, we have the power to live the way that we want to live. In Romans seven, he simply declares the obvious. Everybody, even him, the great apostle, has to deal with sin and the failure that comes with it. But then in chapter eight, however, he explains that despite this reality, Christians have been given the power to follow and do what is right despite the constant urges and temptations to do wrong. Yes, you want to do right, but end up doing wrong. But not every time. But not every time. And the problem, I think, with us as humans, we tend to focus always on those times that we failed, rather than on, on those times that we succeeded. We tend to, at times, look at our lives through the prism of failure rather than through the prism of success that we have in Christ Jesus. You see, sinfulness in our lives is not a foregone conclusion. Let me read another passage, this time Romans 8, verses 12 to 14. He says, so then, brethren, we are not under, excuse me, so then brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So in the end, Paul says, we are subject, we are influenced by sin, yes, every day but we don't have to be slaves to it. We do have the power to overcome it by the Spirit of God if we follow His lead, if we are subject to His will. So the next big question that comes along, especially for those who are continually in one particular sin, see what I'm saying? We all sin in a variety of ways, but sometimes there's one particular sin that you know, gets us every time. We all sin and we tell ourselves, well, this was just an isolated incident, I'll do better next time, I'm going to pray, I'm going to ask God to forgive me, I'm just going to move on. But then sometimes there are sins that come back over and over and over again for whatever reason, we seem to fail more often in this area than overcome in this area. So the question becomes, where's this power I'm hearing about here in the Bible? How come I haven't overcome? How, how come I, I, I can win in other areas of my life, but this particular area just keeps on killing me all the time, keeps on tripping me up all the time? Why? Well, when this happens, a lot of Christians make one of several mistakes. First of all, they stop believing, they think that their you know, lack of success in one particular area means that the gospel is not true somehow. It gives them an excuse to just quit. I quit. I can't overcome this particular thing, I quit. The gospel is not true. Or they stop trying to deal with that sin, thinking that it's impossible, so they might as well indulge in sinfulness in this area and just work on being a better Christian in other areas of life. For example, I'll keep gambling secretly, but I'll increase my contribution to the church. <laughs> you know, one, doesn't one cancel the other out? The answer is no, by the way, if you're just wondering. This is, this is compromise and rationalize, compromise and rationalize. Or they try even harder and deny themselves legitimate things in order to punish themselves for their guilty consciences and end up punishing everybody else around them because they feel guilty all the time. So these methods and others, you know, they never work and they only lead to loss of faith or hypocrisy or legalism or loss of joy. You see, the nature of the power that God gives us through Christ and the Holy Spirit to overcome, here's the thing, to overcome, not eliminate, 
There's a big difference between overcoming something and eliminating something. Eliminate means I never sin again. Overcome means I master this sin. I am the master of this thing. You can overcome, you can overpower, you can master an enemy without killing the enemy. The power to overcome sin is contained in the two main promises that God makes to the Christian described by Paul in Romans 8. Promise number one, he says, we will be judged based on our faith, not our performance. So in Romans 8, 1, that was read previously, now there is no condemnation. Why should there be condemnation? Because there's sin, that's why. He doesn't say now there is no condemnation because no sin exists. He says there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Why? For those who are in Christ Jesus. The operative word there is not because you don't sin, it's because you are in Christ. That's the operative word. The day that I believe, the day that I obeyed the gospel in baptism, the day that I confessed Christ as the Son of God was the day that the sentence of death was lifted from me. The freedom I have is not freedom from imperfection or freedom from temptation or freedom from a, a, a failure. I'm eventually going to have this when Christ comes and resurrects me and I will have a sinless, glorious body. Believe me, the thing I'm looking forward to in heaven is most of all, no more sin in me in you, no more of that. That's the promise. But for now, the freedom that I have is the freedom, the permission to follow the Spirit despite my imperfection. Because there is no condemnation for me, I am saved because of my faith, not because I'm perfect. Otherwise, I, the sinner, the one always tempted, the one who struggles and sometimes fails or fails often, I would not be permitted, I would not be worthy to follow the Holy Spirit with such an unholy life. But as Paul says, I let the Spirit control me and call me and draw me to a better life a life where I can master sin, control it, denounce it, not be afraid of it, and acknowledge it, even if I can't eliminate it altogether. The fact that I will be judged based on my faith rather than on perfect performance gives me the power to deal with my sin without fear or discouragement for as long as I live in this body. I say to my sin, I'm not afraid of you. I will overcome you one day. And then the second promise is, my sinful nature cannot separate me from God. Oh, I know many of you are thinking that this is a contradiction because the Bible says, says elsewhere that sin is what separates us from God, right? Isaiah 59, 2. Well, sin separates us from God, but faith reunites us with God in Christ Jesus. There's the trump card. And once we are in Christ, the power of our sinful flesh no longer has the ability to condemn us before God. In Romans 8.10, what does Paul say? And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. God loves us despite the sin both He and ourselves see in us. The bottom line is that as long as we carry this body around, there will be urges, there will be temptations, there will be failure. But like that hot Egyptian sun, we're not slaves to these things, and they do not destroy our salvation because it is kept safe through faith in the power of Christ based on God's love, not the ability of our flesh to be righteous. Let me read some more out of Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. 
He says, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He tells us nothing can separate us, and you know what? That includes our relative strength or weakness. So what practical lessons can we draw from Paul's teaching on the issue of sin and the power of God in the face of our sinful natures? A couple of lessons. Lesson number one, realize that you're a sinner. Accept it. If you're not a Christian, believe in Jesus and receive forgiveness for these sins by repenting of your sins, confessing His name, and being baptized as soon as possible. And if you are a Christian, realize that you're still a sinner, so get over it. Stop feeling guilty and worried and afraid and discouraged or ashamed. It's, we, it's what we all are. Sinners who have been and continue to be forgiven. Don't be surprised or discouraged that you have to deal with sin. God knows that you'll have to deal with it your entire life. Why should you be surprised? Lesson number two, realize that you need Jesus Christ. We all need Jesus Christ because only He deals effectively with our sins. He has paid the ultimate and complete price for every one of our sins and has made restitution with God on our behalf so we don't have to. He continues to defend and confess our name before, the God, before our God in heaven. You know what, that, just that thing right there, to me, me Michael, is one of the most comforting ideas in the entire gospel that Jesus knows my name and that He is confessing, He is uh, advocating for me in real time before God. And that's comforting because there's another voice that comes to me in the night. And that other voice is the one that says, you're such a loser. <laughs> big time minister, you didn't do this, you forgot to do that, you could have done more over here, you could have studied harder, you, could have, you did two visits, you should have done five, what's the matter with you? There's that voice going all the time, never stops already. And yet Paul tells me that the, the, the creator of the universe, the risen Lord, confesses me, the kid from Rosemount in Montreal, before before God in heaven. And He knows every one of your names as well. And He gives us the Holy Spirit who helps us mitigate the effects of our sinful flesh. So instead of feeling guilty or worried or trying to justify ourselves with excuses or self-righteous hypocrisy, why don't we just allow the Lord to save us and keep on saving us each day? Why don't we just get up in the morning and say, Lord, you keep doing your job and I'll do what you tell me to do today. Let him do the justifying and the saving and we'll do the believing and the persevering. That's our part. We get in trouble because we try to cross over and do the justifying and the saving. Let him do that. Our job is the believing part and the persevering part. One last lesson. Realize that even if it's not perfect, your life is precious and you've got to get on with living it. You know, after Paul finishes explaining this idea about freedom from sin, a little bit later in the epistle, he spends several chapters teaching about how a Christian should live. Because as Christians, our lives are no longer about sin. Yes, there are sins and temptations and that, that, that yappy chihuahua devil always being a nuisance in our life. Yeah, 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 that's there, all right. But our lives are no longer defined by our sins. They are now defined and guided by the Holy Spirit of God. We not only helps us overcome sin, but also creates a new person in us. 
a person who is less and less affected by the sin in his nature and more and more resembling the character and conduct of Christ himself. And the great promise of God to each of His sons and daughters is that if they patiently endure the burden of their sinful flesh and faithfully follow Christ despite this, one day they will be completely like Him without reference to sin anymore. One more passage, Romans 8, this time 22. He says, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. I can't wait to get rid of this body of sin. And Paul is telling us, I'm not the only one. In the meantime, we wait patiently, we live faithfully, we maintain our hope diligently that this freedom from sin will enable us to live glorious lives now and be fulfilled as eternal lives when Jesus returns. Amen and amen. So if you need to deal with sin, if you need to be free from its power, if you need to come to Christ this day, so that this very day He can begin confessing your name before God, then we encourage you to come forward. And if you need strength for the journey as a Christian, need prayer for that, of course. Our elders are here to pray for you, to encourage you, to counsel you. Please, if there's any way that you need to respond, please do so as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.